just quite, uh, quite like to share just some thoughts that I've been having um, on the subject of the church. So there you go. I'll, I'll just share a little bit, if I may. Um, why am I sharing this? Well, some while back, a few months ago, you, you may or may not remember, but I, I shared a few things just about um, kind of instructions. Um, the word from Hebrews chapter 12, a couple of times, see to it that kind of none of you fall short of the grace of God. Um, see to it that you don't not hear what God is speaking to you. And it kind of just followed a little bit of a, a similar theme in some respects. So I'll just be sharing from, from Ephesians, book of Ephesians. Um, but I have to say, when I was reading these verses through, there was actually a real... It kind of challenged me just to read these verses and the instructive nature of these verses about how, we're ha how we should be as his people, as, as the church of Jesus Christ. And uh, I suppose one of the things I wanted to just say right at the outset, really, is that when we're thinking of these things, it's not just the, the church meetings, not just Sunday morning, Sunday evening, the prayer meetings, the men's meetings when they happen, ladies' meetings when they happen, but our kind of church life, if I can call it that, it, it just permeates and, and cascades everything that we do. And I don't know if, how, if that's how you see it. Um, cause it's so easy just to think, right, church, what is church? Church is us coming together, and we do it, and it's wonderful... But when Paul speaks of these things, I think it's all sort of predicated on us being real kind of together. But it's not just here. It could be in homes. could be in care for one, one another. Uh, it could be through visiting. It could be through... It, it kind of permeates everything that we are, I think, I hope, um, and it kind of just challenged me. Some of the language that Paul was using uh, in, uh, in Ephesians chapter 4. And when you look at a book like Ephesians, Paul writing to this, this wonderful church, you kind of look at it, or some people look at it this way, that the first three chapters of Ephesians are predominantly kind of truth and doctrine. And then, just to quote Mike's language uh, when he was praying, there's a revolution that has happened and takes place. And when you enter into, when you enter into chapter 4, I uh, hope I've got my verses all right, I'll have a look in a minute, but, you know, when you get into chapter 4, it's I kind of saying, look, all these truths are truth and real, and you've experienced them. Therefore, what then happens? And what happens is absolutely kind of crucial to, to, to church life. Um, so if we just look at, go back into the book of Ephesians... So the verse I've just spoken about, chapter 4, verse 1, says this, I therefore, this is Paul speaking, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. And that's kind of where, where you could say it's revolutionary living it's a revolution, because it's so different from what we see out there. And it should be so different from what we see out there. The, we're talking about the church. So if, if we just take, for example, some of the, a couple of truths, 
which are so precious to us that Paul speaks about in Ephesians. He's, he's saying this, chapter 2, verse, uh, well, verse 6, for example, down to 10. Uh, and it says, And he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of, bo not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared for sorry, prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So kind of in that, you have a most wonderful truth, don't we? That it's all by grace. It's all undeserved. And we need to get it very clear that um, you know, the, the works that, we, we, that, that are mentioned of here, it's not works to gain salvation, but it's because of salvation we do works. Amen. And it's crucial, crucial that we get it that way round, that, um, that we don't try, you know, often down on the, on the high street we're, we're saying world religions per se, it's I do, I do, I do so I can get I do this, I do that, so I might accrue enough merit or enough of this or enough of that, and then I can be saved. But glory to God, this is the other way around, isn't it? This is the other way around. We, we read of these things in, in the book of Ephesians. We read of these wonderful truths, if you like, the doctrines. And because of those doctrines, then we do works not trying to achieve anything or do anything, but just as a result of what he's done, we do. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift. We remember it's all of a gift. All of a gift. <clears throat> not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which... God prefer, pre, um, prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Then if we travel further, we can, you can just literally land on different wonderful points and we haven't possibly got time to go to them. But look at this in end of chapter 2, verse, 9, verse 19, chapter 2, talking to his church. Now, therefore... You are no longer strangers and, uh, strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. You think, don't you, of your sort of the Old Testament, how there they were in the Garden of Eden at the beginning and and they had to leave the garden, Adam and Eve had to leave the Garden of Eden, and then we find you know, that God was sort of with his people. He was in a, a pillar of fire, wasn't he, by night, and a cloud by day. He was kind of with them, but he wasn't in them. And then we find, don't we, later on, that there he was in the, ta the tabernacle, the tent was erected and put right in the middle of the people. He was there, he was with them, but he wasn't in them. And then we find a physical temple, don't we? We see Solomon building a glorious temple. Build, build that for, for my people, God's instructions. But, but this is just revolutionary, to quote again the words used in a prayer earlier. 
in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. What? God living in, in me, in us. He uses us, brothers and sisters. You might have a view, and you may ha have had conversations where people get really upset with the church. And you might be saying, well, you might have kind of sort of said, yeah, but just... Don't look, don't look at the church, but, but look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. But Jesus wouldn't have that. He actually says, look at my people. Look at us. They are my people. <laughs> they have me dwelling on the inside, a dwelling place of God in the spirit. <laughs> so just to say, oh, don't look too closely at the church. You might not like what you see. Look at Jesus, because he's wonderful. We... I think God would have it the other way around and say, this is my people, with all their failings, <laughs> with all their idiosyncrasies, with all their whatever, these are my people. So you, you pick up these truths you hear of being citizens of another kingdom and so on, and then you, you arrive at the beginning of chapter 4. He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, to walk worthy of the calling which you were called. And you just get, they've had the mercy, the grace of God, the redemption, the blood, the spirit coming. And then what are you to do with it? How are you to live with it? And this is the kind of thing that Paul says, not just here, it's, it's all, I think the, the, these scriptures, they're based on us being a company together together and I look at it and I think wow we've gone through that pandemic I think praise God that we were still able to kind of meet virtually but there's no substitute really day by day week by week as we and I'm emphasizing again it's not just us coming together uh, in, in, in like like now but it's what happens Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We're involved in each other's lives, aren't we? We have small groups working during the, during the week and meeting together. And I'd implore you, if you are not part of a small group, and this is your church, I mean, you might be a member of a small group somewhere else, I don't know, but opportunity for fellowship. To... to, 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 to to build, to see ourselves built up and edify. It's just this bit like, if I'm saying, I'm coming into church on Sunday morning, I come through the doors, I sit there, I say, hi, everyone, I sit for an hour and a half or whatever, I go away, <clears throat> I go back home, and then I'm back the following Sunday. Hi, everyone. There's a deficiency in all that, isn't there? That's not kind of church line. That's not what we're going to read in a minute. It's almost a privatization of faith that can work through, you know, cell phone, iPhone, church. I can be that removed from things. I'm not saying, and I thank, thank God that those who can't physically get here or aren't able to get here can now still participate. I'm not kind of pointing the finger at those who are coming in, zooming in, or anything like that at all. But when we look at some of the things that Paul speaks about, we rub shoulders with one another. We work together. We are. Lots of language, but you can say, well, we are an army. We're his army, called to work together. So... Um, yeah, um, Paul says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, implore you. There's other language. It's to walk worthy of the calling. So based on all the wonderful truths and the revelation, this is how you're to, 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 to live. Um, verse 17 later on shows us how we're not to live. Verse 17 this I that say, uh, chapter 4, verse 17, this I say therefore and testify the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, 
having their understand and understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness and greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. That's how we're not to walk. And it would be just completely... I don't know, it just doesn't fit together. If we've been brought with the blood of Jesus, if we belong to him, if his spirit has come, then that's where we we want to walk according to his ways. We don't want to walk according to the Gentiles or to those out there. We have to be his wonderful church and be different to what's going on out there. We don't want to make it the same in here, do we? I don't think we do. You hear the term seeker-friendly, and I'm sure there are times when you can actively try and kind of bring, engage with people, but at its fundamental level, the church is just different, isn't it, brothers and sisters? It has to just be that way. It's such, to quote again, a revolutionary life. And that's, I suppose, what kind of just caused me to be challenged in my own heart, because I think there is a high calling, and I can easily go back and I can sit on my couch and I can just, you know, view this, watch this, privatise my faith so it doesn't impact. And I don't want that. And I don't want that for us. We've got to be careful of these things. Um, So... So, just a little picture. So, when he says, I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling, I don't know how many of you in your much younger days went on, I don't know, school trips or school outings or things of that nature. Um, Went out in a coach and maybe the teacher got up and said to all the pupils, said to all of us, I'm sure we were all there, right, you're going out into the town but you know what? You're representing Great Marlow School, in my case. You're going out. It's not just about you. You are representing the school. I can remember when we used to go to places like Tynmouth when I was involved in boys' camp. You know, we would kind of have this thing with all the boys. Just remember who we're representing. You know, we don't want to be seen doing daft things or things that are inappropriate, we want to be seen to do the right things. We're representatives. We're going out into a town and we want people to you know, not get in trouble, definitely not, but actually do some good things. I can remember at the end of each of our afternoons when we were in sort of Tynmouth on this big lawn place, we used to get in a great big long line, there'd probably be you know, 120 of us, and we would just do a litter pick. And we would make sure we picked all our own stuff up. But anything else that was there, we just picked up. But do you get that sense? I mean, I don't know if you get it here. I, Paul, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. It's like, (laughs) you're not your own anymore. Does Does it resonate with you that we belong to Jesus? And we want that to touch people. So that we're seen and we be, be being conformed in, in, into his life. So um, I did just drop a few things down. I'll try and get through them. So these next ones, verse 2 and 3, right? Um, let's just read it. Um, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Verse 7, but to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led (coughs) captivity captive and gave gifts to men. 
Now this, he ascended, what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who ascended, sorry, he who descended also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. From whom the whole body, joined and knit together by whatever every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So it's, it's talking, he's talking, I think, about, well, he's talking about the church, it has to be, how we are. And these things are what, as I say, it kind of just spoke to me, really, verses 2 and 3 particularly. I don't know what you think when Paul says, how are you to be? Well, with all loneliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with another, bearing one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. I, I wonder how that <laughs> speaks to you. Let's just pray a moment. Father, Lord, this is your word. We're your people. Just very conscious that Lord, when we hear your word, when we hear you speaking, it really, it can touch us, Lord. Give us ears to hear. Give us up hearts that are open. Thank you, Father, that you, you speak and you're faithful to do that. Amen. Amen. So it's, it's, it's really just kind of some of these lowliness and humility, and I thought those things would have been absolutely despised by most of Ephesus at that time. That's what I mean by us being so different. Do you see what I'm saying? Gentleness, lowliness, it seen can be perceived as being, as being so, so uh, weak. We just look for a moment... Uh, I can find it in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Again, this will be well known to you. <coughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 3, just looking at uh, verse 5. Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believe? As the Lord gave to each one. I planted Apollos water, watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. I just thought of that. I thought, Paul, <laughs> yeah. what are you saying, Paul? You're, he's actually saying that it's all about God. It's all very well. We can do our part. We do what we need to do. We, we, we take on... <laughs> those good works given to us to do, but actually, who gains all the credit? <laughs> for for a, a, a thriving church, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. He who, it's, he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labour. But Paul is basically saying it's all about God. It's all about my, uh, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And I just thought, that word lowliness, what does it mean? It would have been so despised, and you just think, or I think what I see on social media, particularly today, 
And it's all about trying to, um, I'm going to raise my profile. I'm going to increase my influence. I'm going to try and get more followers. How many likes am I getting? It's so self-centered, actually. So much of it. And, and we're kind of caught up in this thing, I think. Um, and we can get, we can get caught up and, 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 and dragged into it. Humility, I mean, that's another word, I guess, for lowliness. Humility, what does it mean to be humble? And it has to be working out, brothers and sisters, amongst us. And it is, I see evidences of it, I think it's wonderful. Gentleness, I mean, what did Christ himself say about himself? Again, if I just try and find, I think it's... Uh, Matthew 11, Christ said this, again, well-known verses, Come to me, all of you who, who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. Lowliness and gentleness, that's just so... Kind of go into a big company today on your, <laughs> for your interview and your first... Day and you kind of say, well, God teaches us to be humble and God teaches us to be gentle. It's another world. It's another world. And I just look, I just think, again, uh, I'll just flit around just for a moment. Um, so this is Timothy talking to Titus. Um, uh, Titus chapter 3, verse 1, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one. I mean, it's written in black and white in the scriptures. To speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts, and it goes on. But what does he say? What is Timothy writing to Titus? These are how God's people should be, speaking evil of no one, gentle, peaceable, showing all humility, and it is so countercultural. Or at least that's how I view it. That's how I see it. But that's what God calls us to in his, in, in his church. Be patient, he, he then says. If I can get back to Ephesians. <clears throat> with all loneliness and gentleness, with long-suffering bearing with one another in love. And those are things that sometimes we just don't like. You know. It's all very well, isn't it? We see a mother or a father with their child. And many of us have been there. And the child, the little toddler, is just starting to walk. And there's great patience involved. And maybe, you know, when you put them on a little bicycle for the first time and you're walking along, kind of behind it, just watching it, Many of us have been there, and that's how, how it works. We, brothers and sisters, patience towards one another. I think we often give ourselves quite a lot of latitude on that one. But perhaps just need to be patient amongst us, amongst God's people. Of course, what do we see so often in the, in the world out there? Well... We don't have to wait for anything now. Why? Why should I have to wait for that? You know, I look and think, you know, my mother sort of said to me, she said, I'm going to put five pounds in the Halifax Building Society for you every, every month. So when you get to sort of adulthood, you can, they can see a pattern of diligent saving. And then I think in the 1980s, it just didn't matter. You could just go and you could just get what you wanted, when you wanted, and it was all on credit. You could just say, oh, I'll have it now. Don't need to be patient. Don't need to save up. I'm, I just want it now. 
And that's kind of how it works out. And that's why it's so kind. I think Paul's saying, here you go, long-suffering, bearing with one another. Another word for that is kind of forbearance. And one of the dictionary definitions of that word is, is not enforcing what is due. Patient self-control. Are we like that with one another? I, I see plenty of evidences of it, but all I can say is I was just reading this stuff and saying, what are you like, Pete, in your dealings in church life? I know, it, 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 and, it, and, it, and it kind of just, just challenged me, and I suppose then you get onto this whole subject of unity. Interesting, isn't it? Endeavouring to keep Verse 3, endeavouring to keep. Endeavouring to keep. Notice the word keep. In other words, I think what he's saying here is you received all these wonderful things. You received the truth of his spirit, the mysteries of God, the mercies of God, the graces of God. You received all these things and, and you were kind of built on a commonality. You came in and you had these things. It was Jesus, only Jesus. So you had it. You had it. It says keep. Keep the unity of the Spirit. You, so, so in other words, not don't construct unity, but, but keep unity. Well, well, how is that? We're all so different, aren't we? And yet he is saying that will be a sign to outside when they see that we are in unity. And how does all that play out? What a, what a kind of, again, it just wham. Because um, in, in kind of history, you hear of those who said, well, you know, doctrine divides and love accepts, that kind of thing. But it's not the way. We don't throw out our doctrine, as has happened at various points in church history, where there was acrimony and disagreement. So, right, let's just, let's just get rid of that. We, I'll tell you what, we just love each other doctrine that can go no no he says here doesn't he uh later on he's saying but speaking the truth in love we may grow up in all things into him who is the head so we 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 kind of think don't we of unity i think of unity i think it's just absolutely incredible even just surveying this room this morning because i could say um I don't know, I could say to Ping, you were raised and brought up in a completely different culture, weren't you? Yeah, you were raised in China. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could say to Nicole, you were raised in Hong Kong, potentially, I think, yeah. Completely different culture, you know, looking around. You know, I could say to Lazarus, where were you raised? Nepal. Nepal. Completely different culture. Juliana, where were you raised? Mozambique. Mozambique. A completely different culture and, and history. You know, Juliano, Ju Juliano, this one. Where were you raised? Brazil. Brazil. Completely different. And you know what? I can sit next to any of those ones. And I can say we're one in Christ Jesus. Amen. And that's the revolution that takes place. Amen. Because we are one and we're unified. And, and if somebody, a visitor, comes in amongst us and starts saying, they're arguing about this and this and this. No, never should it be. Brothers, we work together to get that unity, to keep it to maintain it, because we stand on the finished work of the cross. And we might say to Maria at the back, Maria, where were you raised? Where? Romania. Romania. Different culture, different background. But she is one with us. That's the unity that he's saying, talking about. Endeavouring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. We, we have a high calling we can't just get on our hobby horses. And do you know what? I, I, when I say these things, I'm talking to myself. It's so easy, isn't it? Just to 
you know, go the next seminar, the next bestseller. Yeah, let's, let's go with that. But these are timeless truths that were written to the church in, in, in Ephesus. <laughs> Unity will come about if we are lowly, if we're gentle, if we're long-suffering, if we bear with one another, then that wonderful unity whereby you could go to four corners of the earth, go into a church building and sit next to a brother or sister who loves Jesus with all of their heart, and you could be one with them. <clears throat> so it goes, goes on, I'll move kind of quite quickly now, but... Verse 11, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry. Where do we see these things in operation? In his church. Where? Amongst us. When we gather. But also when we do a work party. When we do a ladies' Christmas lunch. That is church life expressed. When we do a youth camp. When we do a youth weekend, when we go and do outreach, you know, that's when we rub shoulders with one another and that's when we work to keep, to keep the unity. But where are these things, where, where are you going to find out your giftings? Where are you going to find, are you going to, if you kind of reverted to virtual distant church, is it going to come out there? Surely it's here amongst God's people that you're going to find out your giftings. Whether you have a, a gift, to, to, a, a, a heart to evangelize, whether God's calling you to abroad or to another part of the UK to, to do mission, you're not going to find that kind of stuff out except amongst God's people. So, <clears throat> so where were we? <clears throat> Verse 16, I think, we no, verse, um, verse 12, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edification. And it's all for that, isn't it? When you look at, when we're asked to outwork God's life in us, why? It's that his kingdom might be extended. It's might that the body of Christ might be built up and edified. Do we want that, brethren? Do we want to see that happen? Are we... Are we ready? Are we willing? Because it's, it, it costs. It always costs, doesn't it? There'll be a cost involved if somebody tomorrow turns around and says, can we all get round to, I don't know, there's been something happen on the site, can we just do a big clear up or something? It's always inconvenient. It's always, well, let's leave it to the younger generation or leave it to the older generation. I just want to encourage us again. I don't think that God's kind of finished with us as his people, as his body here. I think there's more to come. I honestly believe that. Otherwise, I might as well just go and sit on the couch and watch the Premier League. It's just not God's way, is it? Come on. I'm kind of saying it to myself. Come on. Not work harder, 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 but just be aware of these things and, and recognise that we are his hands, his feet, you hear it, you know. He's chosen to use us. Just a couple more things, really. Um, so verse 14, um, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. And I, sometimes in my own head I kind of think, well, being childlike, that's a good thing, isn't it? But in, being simple, being grateful, when we think of children, they kind of follow their, their parent, and when the parent says do this, they do it up to a certain age, it's all beautiful, and then some other ages come and it's not quite so easy. But... Um, I think what Paul's getting it at is it here in verse 14, that we shouldn't be tossed to and fro and to and fro and be unstable in our Christian lives as we walk with him and we mature 
in Christ Jesus, by the work of the Spirit, there's something that, not that we're not dependent on him, but we kind of grow up and we mature, and that we look back, and I look back, and I say, thank you, Lord, I'm, I can remember things that I did and thought and said, and really, they weren't great. It's a long time ago, I hope. Um, tossed to and fro and carried away with every wind of doctrine, he puts his life into us, and it's powerful, and it's working. Speaking the truth, I mentioned this, but speaking the truth in love, so often I kind of think, well, that's when there's a really hard word to be said, so therefore I need to say it in love. But I kind of look at this and think it's just, we need to speak truth. That is biblical truth. That is what the Bible says. That's kind of doctrine, truth, whatever you want to say. And we, but we love one another. We're marked out as those that love one another. Verse 16, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. And you hear this every year if you're here in multiple different ways, said in slightly different language and so on. But brothers and sisters, it matters. It really matters. (laughs) He says the language here, every joint supplying. And I realise we go through a phase of life where maybe we're just not well and we can't do the things that we want to to do. Um, Or we're very busy at work and and, and, and all this kind of comes in and and restricts us. But Paul says here, by whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. You've got something. If If you're here and you call this your place, where God's put you, then you have much to give. Doesn't, just don't get into this, oh, it's in a meeting, I can't, I, there's so much, so much. There are brothers and sisters in this church that could do with a phone call, could do with a visit, could do with a little bit of help. If you're in on Tuesday uh, evening in the prayer meeting, Lucy said, she said, I'm going every week to see Janet Lunn. Remember Janet? Janet's part of us. Lucy goes faithfully every week to spend a bit of time with Janet. But she said, I don't know if Janet's on. Don't know. Anyway, I'm sure she won't mind. Lucy just said, look, Janet gets lonely. Just something to kind of consider. And I'm, again, I have to look back at myself. I've got an answer for these things too. Um, But it is what every joint supplies according to the effective, the effective working by which every part does its share. You know, we didn't just come, did we, to hear salvation and... You would sometimes hear this, I'm, I'm, I'm saved and it's wonderful and my, uh, the destination is heaven, that's wonderful, but there's work to be done. He talks about it, doesn't he? So there are, just going back, there are good, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared. And I'm not defining those works because there's so much unseen that goes on here and it's wonderful. You know, I think of dear Margie just getting on with it. Just getting on with it. Oh, we're having a men's breakfast. Margie would be there, ready to cook. It, it can't, I suppose what I'm saying is it matters. Every part does its share. It causes the growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. And I will, it's ten past twelve, I could say a bit more, but I think I'll just stop there. But what do we do with these things? What do I do with them? I hear that we're busy. I'll go to someone and ask, you know, can we do this? And people are often so busy. And I, I, it seems to be the plague of the ages, really. But we must make time for one another. We must 
do those good things. We care for one another, love one another, seem to be different. His wonderful church that he calls the bride of, of Christ, his church. We need to sort of sometimes just rise up, don't we? I don't know. That's how I feel sometimes. It's got to, um, not that I need to just work and work harder. Should we, should we just pray? I'll tell you what, if you feel and you know that God's put you here, let's, let's just get on our feet and we'll pray and just commit ourselves again to the Lord. You can pray, I'll pray first, but let's just get on our feet if you want to. <laughs> it's, not a, it's not compulsory.